William, it's so good to connect with you. <laughs> you have been a busy guy over the last month or so, man. You're pivoting every other moment by the looks of it. It's, uh, it, it, the, what do they say? The future belongs to the agile. And I get, I get less agile every day, Carrie. So it's a struggle. <laughs> Hey, you got your COVID haircut. Last time we were together, you didn't have it. So yeah. was it Winnie yeah. who did it or who did it? Uh, well, so it was a group effort. So Winnie and Sarah uh, called, we call her haircut Caroline, but Caroline's a young woman that's cut my hair forever. And uh, she's not, they're closed, obviously. Yeah. And then she's also got like a five month old baby. So she's not doing house calls or anything, but she FaceTimed with them and walked them through the whole thing. And uh, we let her put it on her Instagram. So she sent it out. And so there are diagrams of my head all over social media, uh, if you look hard enough. Pretty good. You know, I got to get mine done. I think it's happening again this week. So I like, I like short hair. But hey, uh, so you did the whole COVID-19, help people through the CARES Act. And then last yeah. week, you, uh, you started helping churches think about reopening the church. My goodness, that happened fast, didn't it? I, you know, we're recording this live, so it's actually current, but the minute we stop recording, it's going to be old news. It's amazing how fast the cycles are going. So we, we did the, I mean, we started with the, how long do you wash your hands? You know, if, you, if you're a non-church goer, you can do happy birthday twice. That gets it done. Uh, if you're a church goer and an Anglican or something, you could sing the doxology. That's 20 seconds. But uh, so we did that. And then we did the covid19.com churchcovid19.com and then in the states the the cares act that the uh congress uh, passed to help small businesses and churches and nonprofits and that was a really important conversation but but it felt carry to me and it could just be i'm down in texas so things are getting green and it's getting warm outside and we have easter so maybe it feels like we're moving towards something new but somewhere in my gut on about Tuesday night, I thought there's a shift. I can feel it. The conversation's moving past infections, which are still important, but to how do we get this thing open again? And, and I mean, your content's been so valuable because so much of what we're having to do now can't just get left at the wayside uh, right. once, once we're through all this. So the, so the question is, what gets kept and what doesn't and what looks the same and what doesn't and, and we can't as they say flip a switch and just go back to church so what does that all look like and, and we decided uh, let's do a, 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 a zoom call with a couple people and in like five minutes I texted uh, Matt Chandler and Eric Geiger and Dave Dummett the new pastor at Willow and Brian Carter and Jeannie Stevens and Josh Surratt and everybody's like yeah sure I'll do it so all of a sudden we had a webinar and, and we can try and line those calendars up. It was amazing. Oh yeah, my goodness. Thing. So we were like, okay, we'll launch on Monday. That's great. This is back on Thursday. And that was at about two o'clock. And at about four o'clock, uh, the president announced he was going to have a press conference about reopening America. So I called our IT people and said, so that Monday thing, that's going to need to happen in about an hour. And, uh, <laughs> and they pulled it off and, and then like, AP News and the New York Times and several people picked it up and ran with it. So it kind of turned into a tiger by the tail. And, and now it's not just a webinar, it's a conversation. So yeah, like yeah. tomorrow we'll have uh, uni Christian university presidents on a conversation about what do we do with the fall semester? I mean, mm -hmm. it's a big deal. And then Tuesday we'll have pastors of normal sized churches, which I think there's going to be an enormous premium on the church of 100 to 300 in the coming five years because of this and there are a lot of reasons for that but we're going to host and i want to go there yeah and then thursday we're going to we're going to host some folks that you know from orange jess beeler and a few other great kid men people are going to join oh, us because yeah. that's like the leading question what do we do with nurseries and and kids don't quit talking to each other and touching so how do we so we're trying to be a holistic mm -hmm. conversation and we're figuring it out as we go no, that's great. And uh, what's the website if people, obviously, yeah. vanderbloomen.com, which everybody can spell like Newhoff. Yeah, and, and you don't have to. You, you know right. this drill. You just type whatever you think Vanderblumen should be. Q-Z-F-Y-Z, and it turns yeah. out to be Vanderblumen. But yeah. it's, it's, it's reopeningchurch.com. And then we're also, uh, we have a, a subsite, reopeningschool.com, because the Christian university scene and divinity semin and seminary is they they might have a harder time than church but reopeningchurch.com is where you'll find the kind of the hub for all these conversations we'll have 
several a week. In fact, today I had a great interview with Jimmy Miotto, who's the CEO of Compassion. Yeah, yeah. Compassion. So what does that look like? Reopening Compassion. I mean, it's, it's a, and, and he told a great story. He said, you know, the, he used to run the Willow Creek Association and he said, Leadership Summit would not have happened without 9-11. 9-11 happened and then we're sitting around saying nobody's going to get on a plane and fly to Chicago. What are we going to do? And then they started the multi-site. Isn't this that interesting? So that whole idea of, you know, uh, crisis being the cradle for innovation. Yeah. I'd love to know if you could summarize some of the key insights from the panel that you put together yesterday with like Matt Chandler, uh, Dave Dummett, Jeannie Stevens, Brian Carter, and all the others what were some of the consensus points and the divergence points about how church will reopen? Realizing, by the way, this is going to be different in 50 different states, the way it's Well, that's out. right. That's yeah. right. And, and it's not just states. So, so first of all, the consensus. The consensus was, these are some of those brilliant thinkers. And I figure if I get people smarter than me on a call, I'll learn things. But the consensus was very, it was unanimous that none of us know. Right. I mean, like, really, none of us know. Now, there were some good ideas, uh, but there are things like, you know, and, and I, I started with the guys and Jeannie uh, uh, that were in very large rooms because they're mm -hmm. arguably going to be the last people to open. Right. right? You know, if you, if you, the minute in the U.S., the minute there's a green light for groups of 200, 85% of all churches can open up, no problem. And, mm -hmm. you know, how will be different, but the what. Now, you know, there's a question of, well, what about 200 people in an auditorium for a thousand versus like, you know, Willow has 7,800 seats. Like that's yes. like NBA, you know? So Poor Dave, yeah. Like he's going there and he's got 7,800 seats. You got to be six feet apart. Like what do you that's do? That's right. That's right. So, so I think the consensus was nobody really knows, but everybody's really leaning in uh, where, where we, we ended up drilling down that I learned the most was talking about preaching and how it's going to change. Uh, some of the things like, you know, learning the camera angles. I think you've had some great content on that. We've tried to put a few things out, like literally, how do you preach to a room? To, but it, to it, this. Got really, mm -hmm. it got really vulnerable. We've got the replay up on the site if people want to see it. But it got real vulnerable where I think everybody in the room was like, you know, I'd like to think that I preach for Jesus alone. But I've had moments where I'm preaching in a room alone going, yeah. I, I actually miss the crowd and the, and the affirmation. And that's not healthy. So, you know, there's that. I've had another thought recently. I'll just balance it off. You see what you think. I wonder if there's two types of communicators. Uh, all of us, and I mean, you've done your share of preaching over time too, William, but, you know, we were trained to speak to live crowds in rooms, whether you're a preacher. A well, actually I, actually, I spoke to Presbyterians, so that's debatable. Oh, yeah, that's true. So. I don't know if they were alive or not, but... Uh, <laughs> It's hard to tell. Hard to tell. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Apparently not. Not okay. really. <laughs> no, no, I can't. Um, but I wonder if there's another younger, like YouTube generation that is just speaking to cameras, just digital native. And yeah. that's just what they do. And the crowd is weird. If the crowd is there, the crowd is weird. And I wonder if you're going to see that kind of bifurcation in the next generation of preaching with digital right. first preachers and people like us who are cut their teeth in the room. Well, and unless we have highly segmented churches by age, I think you're going to have to find people who are, I call them polylingual, like mm. not just one way of talking, but lots. And I think the way that, that this uh, quarantine period has forced families to be together will create a new norm for intergenerational environments in churches. That, that we really drifted away from some in, mm -hmm. in the last 10, 15, 20 years. So I think uh, it's even more pronounced with college presidents, but with it, you're going to have to find the senior pastor that can preach from his phone right here and be very convincing and winsome and then stand in front of a stage and know how to work that as well. And, yeah. and a, that's going to be a, skill set. a different kind of pastor. A and by the way, uh, the challenge that one of my very good friends who's a pastor here in town, he got vulnerable with me and said, you know, William, I'm scared to death. And I said, why? And he said, because my congregation has now finally figured out they can Netflix whatever preacher they want on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And I can't compete with Steve Furtick. And I can't compete with Matt Chandler. And I don't know if they're going to listen to me again. So there's a whole different, like, so then I, I think I know what that means. I think there are a few mm. very particular things people are going to have to focus on to be relevant in their local parish. 
uh, that'll be different than we've seen before. It's going to be a new kind of pastor, I think. So was a consensus then that this is not a case of whenever you can be open, whatever that looks like, you just turn the lights back on and everything's the same as it was, or are they sensing the people that you've been talking to and your own intuition? No, we're moving into a different world. I, I think it's both and. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, we've had this conversation offline, but I remember being a pastor the Sunday after 9-11. Mm -hmm. And uh, September 11th was on a Tuesday. So we had almost a full week. And it wasn't like the day after. And we couldn't find enough chairs to fit in the room. Yeah. And, and there, there's a thing in, you know, the creation narrative is real clear. God calls all these things good. The first thing he curses is he says, it is not good for people to be alone. So like there is an innate longing in us. Uh, Eric Geiger says, the reason we love worship gatherings is because they're an echo of what we'll find in heaven. Mm -hmm. And they're never as good as the real thing in heaven, but they're an echo. Now that we have internet driven worship, it's great. It's golly, it's the new front porch to your house and people can show up and churches are growing, but it's just an echo of the echo. So right. It, it won't replace. So, so I think it's a both and. And then the question becomes, do we do, you know, like clients we have that have old school Sunday school buildings, do we have 10 classrooms of 50 and have gatherings of 50 that way? Do we, what do we do with kids? Do we have to be far apart? Uh, I'm hearing a lot of people say, I, I could envision, and I'm getting affirmation behind this, people becoming more, um, like a, a Catholic church that has eight or nine masses on a weekend. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe you record the first one and then you're just floating around being with people during the, uh, on Saturday and Sunday to disperse crowds. And uh, uh, because I don't think people are going to stay away from church. I, I, I have heard some people say, well, everybody's going to be afraid of the virus. I'm like, look, have you read the Old Testament? Do you know mm. how quick we, we forget so quickly what's dangerous for us? <laughs> it's just like, you know, People get in trouble. God comes down on them. Please help us, oh Lord. He helps them and heals them. And within and it's like, yeah, days, yeah, we're on with things. Yeah, yep. within three days, there's an Asherah pole or a golden calf or something built that you know. So I, I think we we won't remember how dangerous this is, and we really want to be together. So the, the coming together is going to happen. It's just a question of how how do we meter that? How do we do it safely and responsibly? And then how do we pivot? so that people don't just sit in Netflix preaching, but have a, a very new, different, granularly contextualized relationship with their pastor who happens to preach and not a preacher who happens to be called pastor. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting pivot. And we're not really gonna know until we get there, right? I think that's and, right. And if there's a second wave, nobody really knows whether there will be a second wave or what happens. I got a text this morning from a guy trying to make decisions. And he just said, you know, I'm tempted to open up next week. But what if there's a second wave? I just end up looking foolish at that point. And yeah. those are the real dialogue. Anything else that you picked up in the leaders that you've been talking to, whether it's that panel, but you're like super hyper connected that you think uh, we need to pay attention to as we move into the reopening? I'd say overwhelmingly, the biggest question that I'm hearing is what are we gonna do with kids ministry? Because you can't keep kids six feet apart. They're like, you know, Chandler said, it's like a anthill at his church. They're just everywhere, you know, and, and what are we gonna do with that? I would say secondly, uh, there's a new uh, requirement for the tech and production people in a church. They've had to step their game up significantly during this pivot. So can they continue at that pace? Are we gonna have to restaff? I think you're gonna see some new staff positions happening. I'm hearing a whole lot about a chief communications officer taking the place of a whole lot of associate pastor roles. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the ability to communicate now fast and by whatever the latest TikTok or thing is that comes out is, is just, way too fast and furious. So I think you're going to see uh, quite a few shifts in the types of people that are needed for staff positions and the types of staff positions that happen as we reopen. So let me bounce this off you. There was a Canadian blogger who a few years ago, nobody takes his stuff seriously, said that in the future, churches may actually be spending 20 to 50 percent of their staffing budget online. Do you think that's uh, anywhere true? I hadn't really thought about the percentages. I bet it's more than we'd like to think it is. 
Yeah. Because my experience, William, I mean, that's something I've been talking about for a couple of years and it fell on total disbelief until the crisis hit. But, um, you know, I look at the way a lot of large churches do it, including some well-known mega churches. I won't drop any names, but it's like, okay, William, here's your job. You run service programming, creative, uh, and also can you maintain our website? And also can you do our social media? And also, like you don't have a lot of dedicated staffing to online ministry. Do you imagine that might start to... I think it'll totally change. I mean, now... One thing that won't change is every job description for every staff person at every church in America has the line, other duties as necessary. <laughs> like that's just the way it's going to be till Jesus gets back. But, but I do think you'll start to see dedicated resources. I think you're going to see more, uh, particularly in churches of a thousand or more, uh, a dedicated development office like uh, mm-hmm. a, a giving a chief charitable officer, a giving pastor, a stewardship pastor. Some of the largest churches have been doing that for a while, but I think it's going to, maybe it's a part-time person that used to be in the development world that goes to the church. But I think you're going it's, to, it's not that the money's not there. It's just going to require a more intentional and focused effort to, to pull it out. Hey, we invited a handful of leaders uh, to this conversation who are sitting in the background while you and I chat. Uh, leaders, we'd love to hear your questions, so make sure you send them. And uh, Dylan, I know from my team who's there, if you need to text me some of them, whatever. But uh, William and I have got some time to take your questions and would love to hear it. Some of these leaders lead some very large churches. Some of them lead some small churches. Some were not digital a month ago. They're totally digital now. And so we're all in the midst of it. So would love to take your questions uh, on this Zoom chat. And, and from a U.S. perspective, Carrie. If unless your church is 50 people and you're bivocational, I don't call you a small church. You are mm-hmm. a normal church. The backbone of the church in America is congregations of 100 to 200. And it's about half the work we do. And I think they get lost in the press. But I really think the highly contextual pastor to a local parish is going to have a new gold standard for leading churches. Not that big churches won't keep being big and being wonderful, and the big church makes a big difference, but the pastor who can pastor their local community and offer weekly messages that are crafted around what happened in the community that week and what does God have to say about that. Like that's going to be a, a brand new open field to uh, fruit for ministry in the, in the normal sized church. Do so you think the normal sized church, which I love the way you describe it, is, uh, has got a bright future ahead of it? Much more than before this. Hmm. Yeah. Because they're local, they're personal. Kelly wants to know, um, they're using Zoom for their weekend services, kind of a technical question. Is there a platform that you think is a good fit? Well, I think uh, if you haven't heard of Craig Groeschel, uh, yeah, go to his, him. yeah, the church online platform that he uh, offers totally for free is really great. Zoom works well too, as long as you use the password protected and, and I would go ahead and do the paid account. Uh, I've not heard of anybody having Zoom bombing on a, a, a business level account. <laughs> Yeah, so, it's true. You know, it's funny because we've been using Zoom for years and years and years, even at its almost beta stage. And I've never been Zoom bombed, but we, yeah. we have the pro account. Uh, I think that can go great. Mike wants to know, and so does Scott, same thing. Hey, would you recommend, uh, how would you go about uh, creating opening strategies with so much uncertainty? How many different scenarios would we focus on with respect to uh, restrictions? So if Mike and Scott are doing some um, planning, they're trying to think, how do we even craft a scenario when the governor could change his or her view any moment when the city might impose new restrictions, when it's probably going to be gradual? Great question. That is a great question. I- I'd love to know the answer. I-, I can tell you, I can tell you the things I'm kicking around and hearing around. Uh, one thing I heard, and I heard it from these fabulous preachers in our thing yesterday, is they've all kind of abandoned the long range sermon planning. Like it's over, you know, it, it, whatever we had planned, <laughs> Geiger said he was Your 12 months plan. Yeah. Well, Geiger was starting a seven week sermon series on the seven deadly sins when this started. And he's like, that probably is not going to work. So <laughs> we've backed off that and went into the Psalms. So I it, it, seriously, though, I really do think like, um, Carrie, you may have heard me tell this story before, but years ago, I, I, I got to the age where I have to stretch after I run. And, uh, you know, that the stretching is kind of harder than the running. 
Yeah, and, sometimes. Uh, it, it, all the time for me. And I was trying to stretch and touch my toes and I couldn't do it. And my youngest walked in, she was about three or four years old and she just looked at me and sat down and as only a three-year-old can do, tied herself in a human pretzel and then stood up and looked at me, didn't say one word, laughed and <laughs> left the room. And, and it dawned on me, like, this is a biological fact for William's life and yours too. Every day I'm alive, I get less flexible. Yep. So like, it's just, and it's true of churches and teams and everything else. And that dog will hunt, you can preach that. But, but I think the people who are going to open well are the ones who are going to do something every day to stretch their team, to create agility, to give a task that wasn't given before, to keep throwing a, a measured and carefully numbered amount of curveballs toward your team so that you're just used to hitting them because it's yeah. going to be different. I've got a blog post coming on this in the next week, but I am worried right now that six weeks into this di disruption, pastors have kind of figured out a temporary new normal and they're just hanging out there going, okay, now we know what works. We're just going to do it. It's like, no, 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 no. The innovation is just starting. That's right. Like, I know it's uncomfortable. It's disruptive. It's, it's annoying, but like keep throwing spaghetti at the wall physical and digital, yeah. see what happens. You, this is such an incubator for growth and opportunity. And I see a lot of churches doing, okay, now we're doing the Tuesday prayer, the Wednesday Q and A, Sunday five services. And I know we all want a new normal, but maybe th that's not the place to normalize. Well, and, and one way that I've found to do it, it's a, I can't take credit for it. Rick Warren told me years ago uh, that really smart leaders will intentionally and at the right pace, inject chaos into their teams correct you can't do it all the time but, but inject enough chaos that they're just sort of used to it and it's like okay well there's another curveball let's hit it and and then the other thing so if it's agility i'd say the other thing if if there were a prayer focus for leaders mm -hmm. right now it would be a pray for wisdom yeah. like be like the men of issachar who knew and understood their times be like solomon he asked for wisdom and god said you just asked for the best thing and, and the, the verse that just grabbed my heart years ago and made this my morning prayer is, you know, we have this much on Jesus' teenage years, right? And which is probably proof that teenagers are just hard no matter who you are. But uh, in that little bit, we hear the boy Jesus grew in wisdom. Now, now my theology tells me that when he was born, he was born 100% God. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the, the Old Testament words for God move around, and one of them is Sophia, wisdom. He was born 100% wise, and he grew in wisdom. So, so, like, if Jesus needs to grow in wisdom, <laughs> I do too. And, and the root yeah. of that is discernment. You know, the prophets of the Old Testament weren't known for seeing 500 years into the future. They were actually just the first really good political consultants. They could see a little farther than everybody else and take a step, just a half step before everybody else. And that's all you need to do, guys. You don't have to figure out what it's going to look like in two years. Just pray for discernment and stay agile. And you'll know what's right for your context in your moment, even if it has to change later on. That's such a great word. Adam uh, Starling is with us from Oklahoma. He wants to know, can you guys talk about what um, you project finances to look like in the next six to 12 months in churches? In churches in Houston, where oil is right at $30. Oil is now below I will pay zero. You. you pay me to take this oil, okay, William? Yes, my neighbors are filling up their pools with crude oil. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, you know, so I, I'm just kind of a hopeless optimist. I, I really think, you know, the, the, we live in a comedy, not a tragedy. We've mm. seen the third act of the play and, and it's the crux, literally. Uh, the cross has happened. Uh, and, and I look back to history to try and predict future. Now, this is an unprecedented moment, right? Mm -hmm. But if you look in the United States and you ask people who know about giving and charitable work, the closest America ever got to tithing was at the height of the Great Depression. So now we have less resources to give away. So you're giving more of less. So maybe, it, you know, you're going to have to be scrappier and work harder. But the idea that, that churches are just going to go in the toilet just because the economy is going down, I think is a false assumption. Now you mm. might have to work harder. My, yes. my friend, Jim Shepard, who runs Generis. That, that yeah, I was just on 45 minutes with him this morning picking his yeah, brain. He, well, maybe he said this to you then. But he, he said, I'm, I'm not hearing any giving problems that can't be fixed. 
it used to has to, it usually has to do with the asking moment and is the pastor really stepping up and asking or not now that that may be too simplistic but i'm a little bit bullish that this moment will draw more charity out of people than we've seen in years past and more focused charity around the gospel and what the gospel is trying to get done and not just whatever 501c3 wants your hand it's really interesting. Here's what I'm seeing, and this is through Church Pulse Weekly, a little bit talking to Jim Shepard. Uh, I got an interesting message from Scott Harrison on char and Charity Water over the weekend, which I'll share in just a moment. Um, Scott's very alarmed, and I think I can say it. He sent me a podcast interview he did uh, for another podcast. I'm going to interview him, I think, next week again. But he noticed a pretty massive drop in the number of $10 a month uh, millennial supporters to Charity Water, but also uh, a drop in the well, which is his private Silicon Valley high net worth individual people who obviously have taken, you know, seven figure hits to their net worth that they also bailed. So he, he thinks this is going to be, and we were messaging back and forth Saturday, Sunday, he thinks this is going to be 12 to 24 months of uncertainty, and it's probably going to hit the most vulnerable people. So if you're a server uh, at a restaurant and you just lost your job and you're giving 20 bucks a month to clean water around the world, it's one of the first things you cut. So he's felt it. I've also noticed in the Church Pulse Weekly data, now 80% of churches say they have the same attendance, whatever that means, or better than they did in attendance based on, in physical attendance based on views. But uh, an inverse proportion, the majority still are seeing a decline in giving, which is really interesting. On the other hand, I talked to Mike Todd. This will be out on my podcast next week. Yesterday, Mike's giving has gone through the roof at Transformation Church, so have a number of others. And I wonder if what's happening, uh, Jim Shepard this morning had this to say, I think it's a, a Warren Buffett quote, uh, but when the tide goes out, you see who was wearing trunks and who wasn't, and That's the right. tide just went out. <laughs> and you know, there are some people who are ready for this, and there were uh, some people who were not. And, and we're, I think there's gonna be like a, a sifting of sorts. Yeah, we're, we're also living in, hopefully not the heels of, but, but certainly well into the era of everyone wanting to do a startup in the US. Yeah. So, you know, you've got on the one hand, startup businesses, we're arguably a startup, we're 12 years old. So am I. And, and I'm feeling it. We applied for the PPP, you know, uh, help from, from Congress. Uh, on the other side, you, you, you're going to find that there are a lot of church plants who've been working with very, very little margin and uh, the tide's going out and there are no trunks on. So I, I, I don't know. I, I also just hear different things. I, all I know is my sample size. I know that the first two or three weeks in March when this really hit, there were giving cratered. It was terrible. Yeah. Uh, now, since then, since about April, Nearly everybody we talk to, now arguably we talk to people who hire us to do work and it's not inexpensive, so maybe we have a skewed size, but nearly all of them have said, no, it's, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. Yeah. And Tom Rayner's most recent sampling and his, his audience would be the you know, First Baptist Church of a small town in somewhere, like 78% of all the churches said they're at or just below pre-COVID giving. So I really... Right. It, Kind of yeah, depends. I think you're right. I think, I think there's going to be winners and losers. I think you're going to see some of the bigger churches get bigger. I think yes. you will see consolidation. I think you'll see some of the winners really win. And I think you'll see uh, some flops as well. But I, I would say, you know, the key is to have a clear vision, a clear mission, a sense that you're leading, not reacting, moving into the future. Last question, which I love from one of our uh, leader circle people, what questions should we be asking, but are not? What do we not see coming? Well, I'll tell you the question I wasn't asking. Uh, I know, Carrie, you've read the piece Andy Crouch wrote about, I think it's called Leading Past the Blizzard or something or other. And I made the incredibly bad mistake of reading that right before bed. It's not a bedtime story. No, uh, it, It's fairly bleak look. I think the mistake I made early on was saying, okay, this will blow over. Americans are resilient and we'll just get right back at it and we'll have a huge surge in attendance right away. And this is going to be amazing. And I think what, what we, what we think now where we're sitting is, it is going to be amazing on the other side of this, mm -hmm. but the this has gotten wider 
<laughs> from before to whatever's after. And, and I don't know how wide that is. Yeah. So, you know, I was reading an article, Carrie, uh, from the Harvard Business Review about businesses that flopped first after the crash in 08. Hmm. Okay. And then, so they divided in four quadrants who flopped first, who lasted longest. The first businesses to, to go out of business were the ones that cut their staff and their costs too quickly. Oh. Like they just cut too fast. The second group that failed were the ones that didn't do anything until it was too late. Hmm. And the, the, the third and fourth, the ones that lasted the longest were, were a tightrope of the two. And, and that's where I get back to just asking God every day, give me wisdom. We, yeah. made, we made adjustments and, and I would rather cut fewer times and cut deeper and get it done and be positioned uh, than, than, than not. But, I, you know, Andy talks about it. Is this a, a, a blizzard? Is it a long winter or is it an ice age? Yeah. I don't know how to plan an organization for an ice age. That's like planning for nuclear fallout. I mean, yeah. so, but, but I do think I, he has helped me adjust my view from this is just this long to you better be ready for it to go on through the summer yeah. and whether or not something happens in the fall is a speculative thing that smart people disagree on. We're definitely in a winter. Uh, David Kinnaman put me onto that article in the opening days. Andy wrote it in uh, mid-March, late March. And I, I totally agree. I, I wonder, I had a long conversation with Mark Sayers uh, recently and he has more of a global perspective just because of where he is in Australia, how he reads. He thinks this is going to be a massive disruption and that perhaps what you'll see is a lot of this. So the W, yeah. you know, maybe it's a W, maybe there's a little bit of this, yeah. maybe it's an L. And I think you're right. And, and that's interesting. I'll have to look because I have a subscription to HBR as well. But that idea, I was shocked at how quickly some companies just cut, 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 and they like just kicked everyone out overnight. And well, like, and, and, you know, one thing, Carrie, sorry to interrupt, that, that I'm not hearing anyone talk about yeah. is this question. Has there ever been a time in human history when the entire medical community around the world is working on the same problem? Correct. And I don't want to sound Pollyannish, but... God has given us an amazing creative mind and an amazing innovation. And you remember the Tower of Babel when they were going to build a tower all the way up to God and God looked down and everybody, it says they were all working together. And God looked at the angels and said, if they all work together, there's nothing they won't be able to do. And so he scattered them with blankets. But the, the redeemed side of that is if the entire medical community of the world is all working together on the same problem, I've got to believe a solution's going to come quicker than it ever has in history. Mm -hmm. I love that thought. And that's a great place to wrap up. William, appreciate your friendship, appreciate your partnership and so many things. And uh, love how you have just had the heart to come alongside people and really be beside them. So Leader Circle members got a surprise for you. Looks like tomorrow we're going to bring Henry Cloud on. We'll be sending you some details on that, but uh, really excited for you to be answering some questions for Leader Circle's members and uh, indirectly for the wider audience. William, appreciate your friendship and your Thanks leadership. Thanks so much, Carrie. You. God bless y'all.